So the second presenter today is Jennifer Moss, and Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Penn State University. She is a social and behavioral scientist focused on geographic disparities in primary and secondary cancer prevention behaviors. She serves as a principal investigator on projects to examine theory-based, innovative approaches um, to a to affect equitable and sustainable strategies to increase cancer screening among women in rural counties. Her research also examines differences by rurality and community social economic status in behaviors such as smoking, physical activity, and HPV vaccination. Her long-term goal is to reduce geographic disparities in cancer risk and cancer outcomes. And the title of her presentation today is um, MDAC, and the concordance of multiple level socioeconomic data. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for um, the opportunity to share some of our work today. Uh, as Kathy said, I'm going to be presenting on um, socioeconomic status, status measures across the socioecological uh, levels and seeing how well these um, the match up across different levels, the, the level of concordance. Um, so, you know, broadly, uh, socioeconomic status reflects your um, relative social position. Uh, it's operationalized as income, education, occupation, lots of different ways, um, combinations of these variables or other variables as well. Um, most often in public health, we use income. Um, or some measure derived from income, but this is not always available in survey data sets or in administrative data sets. Um, when it is, it's usually measured via self-report, captured with self-report, uh, which raises some concerns about missingness and accuracy of the data. So to address those issues, some scientists use aggregated measures of socioeconomic status, um, for a given geographic unit, a, a given area, uh, census tract or county or census block. Um, and, you know, when we, when we use this sort of approach, we see results that are broadly consistent with what you see with individual level socioeconomic status uh, variables. So here's an example from a few years ago looking at um, a census tract index combining multiple indicators um, of socioeconomic status, uh, which was related to lung and bronchus cancer incidence. So across these different race groups that are listed here, um, if you lived in a census tract with a higher socioeconomic status, you were less likely to be diagnosed with, with lung cancer. Um, so across a number of outcomes, this is something, something that we see. Uh, but using these area-level measures as proxies for individual-level SES um, has some advantages and disadvantages. In terms of advantages, um, you know, these data are publicly available and we have near-complete coverage. So if you go to the census data website, you can find um, pretty good high-level coverage for every census tract, census block, uh, county um, in the country, and you can you can find that data freely available on on the internet. Um, but of course, we we have to balance that with the the lo the lower level of specificity for these variables. Obviously, we know that there's variation in income, for example, within a, a given geographic unit. Um, so we have the data uh, introduce some um, error, some unknown variation that, that we can't account for. Um, I do want to acknowledge, though, that we can use area-level measures of socioeconomic status for other purposes, um, principally to reflect characteristics of a community. Um, so, you know, your median household income in a county can reflect the tax base to support education or health promotion initiatives. That's more of a contextual um, variable that reflects something about the community rather than a proxy for individual level SES. So I'm not going to focus on this today, but rather 
um, using these area level measures as proxies. So for this study, I wanted to um, examine these studies, examine um, the, the concordance and agreement for the area level SES measures versus the individual measures. And then to um, begin to assess how much this misclassification influences our estimates of the relationship between SES and health outcomes, um, which is quite robust in, in a lot of literature, and we heard some of that from Gina just a couple minutes ago. Uh, to do this, I used the MDAC data set to um, collect the individual level SES variables. Um, so as, as we heard earlier, this is um, mil four and a half million observations uh, from the 2008 American Community Survey linked to national death index records through 2015. Um, then we also incorporated uh, five-year estimates of, of SES variables for census tracts and counties from the American Community Survey. So overall, um, I had three, about three and a half million individual level observations. Um, about 2.8 were linked, 2.8 million were linked to census tracts, 2.85 linked to counties. Um, so then we can compare across these levels the, the SES variables. Um, briefly, the SES measures, I, I evaluated a number of them, eight of them listed here. Today I'm just going to focus on household income. So at the individual level, this is, is your household income less than or equal to the U.S. median, or is it greater than the U.S. median? And then similarly for census tracts and counties, do you live in a census tract or county that's um, below or above the U.S. median for household income in, in census tracts or counties? Okay. Um, and the mortality outcomes, I, I am focused for this analysis just on all cause, any cause mortality um, over our follow-up period, yes or no. Right. And then. Analytically, I tested the performance, the concordance of these variables across levels using a, a number of metrics, Spearman's correlation coefficient, sensitivity and specificity. Um, and then we also assessed differences in the performance by individual level race and ethnicity, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, we used logistic regression to predict, um, to estimate this relationship between mortality and SES and how that estimate differed um, for individuals versus census tracts versus counties. Okay, so let's get into the data now. Um, so when we looked at household income um, for, for individuals, you know, this is a median variable, so about half of individuals, census tracts, and counties were below versus above the median. There's some variation because of rounding and, and other issues, but basically we have about half of people below versus above. And then when we cross-classify individual versus census tract income, what we see is that about a third of, of individuals have low incomes and live in low income census tracts. Then 21% have a low income but live in high income census tracts. 17% have high incomes and live in low income census tracts, and the rest have high incomes and live in high income census tracts. So the way we interpret this, right, if census tract income was a perfect predictor of individual level income, we would actually only see two wedges in this pie. It would be 50-50. All of the low income individuals would live in low income census tracts and vice versa for high income. On the other hand, if, if census tract income and, and individual income were completely unrelated, uh, we would see 25% of people in each of these, each of these wedges. Um, so we see that, that the actual observed distribution um, d isn't either one of those, but, but much closer to the 25% um, in each. Uh, so, so low the income at the census tract level is not doing a particularly good job predicting individual level income. 
And we see this borne out in the performance characteristics. Our Spearman's R correlation is about 0.2. Specificity and sensitivity are around 60%. Um, but there is, you know, there is a relationship. The odds ratio for um, being high income based on the having a high income census tract versus low income was about 2.3. So there is some signal here, but it's not it's not very strong. And we can do the same thing for individuals compared to counties. Um, so here we see. Similar sorts of estimates, about 31% are low income in low income counties, 22% 20, and then 27% of, of high income individuals, sorry, 27% of the population has high income, and lives in a high income county. So this one is even, um, county compared to census tract is even poorer at, at predicting individual level income. So the R correlation is 0.17, specificity and sensitivity are now um, below 60%, and the odds ratio is 1.3. And then when we look at the, the concordance across race and, and ethnic groups, um, this is what we see. And, and the way we can interpret this is that um, compared to the non-Hispanic whites, the, the non-Hispanic minorities um, are actually more likely to live in a census tract that has an income level similar to their own. There's more sorting of these non-Hispanic minorities into low versus high uh, census tracts. Um, it's, a, it's in the opposite direction for Hispanics. They're actually less likely to be sorted into census tracts with income similar to their own. Um, and, but what does this mean, right, for our estimates or our studies of public health? Um, so the, the individual level, at the individual level, having high income was um, protective against mortality over the follow-up period. Um, basically, the odds ratio here is 0.32 for having high versus low income. Um, compared to 0.782 for census tracts and 0.803 for county. So the, the protective association between high income and um, lower mortality, um, that relationship was much stronger for individual level SES than census tract or county. So anytime we rely on these, these aggregated measures of SES are probably underestimating the relationship with, with health outcomes. So in summary, these area level measures of SES um, are not great at predicting individual level SES. They demonstrate suboptimal agreement with the individual level measures. Uh, the concordance or agreement is actually higher for census tracts versus counties and for some subgroups, including the non-Hispanic minorities, males, people who are older and living in urban communities. So using these area level measures um, as proxies for individual level SES really underestimates the relationship between SES and mortality, um, as I showed in the last, the last slide. I do want to acknowledge some, some limitations to the data and the analysis. Uh, we did use different time periods for individual versus area level measures of SES. We used the five-year estimates from the American Community Survey for the census tract and county um, SES variables. And um, obviously there's some, some variation that arises through combining multiple years. In particular, you know, this, this time period included the Great Recession, so a lot of um, change going on in, in individual as well as area level SES during this period. Um, and, and I limited this analysis to just dichotomous variables of SES, um, partly because some of the individual level measures of SES are by definition dichotomous, you know, employed versus unemployed, do you have a high school degree, yes or no, um, and just to make things equivalent across levels. But we've, a lot of times we look at particularly income using um, more than two levels, you know, quartiles, quintiles, et cetera. 
Um, so the results could could be different if we used more fine-grained um, SES variables. That remains to be seen. But overall, the implications um, for scientists is if your study must use these area-level proxies of SES um, for individual-level SES, it's better to use household income or college education. These were the, the two indicators that performed the best in terms of the, the correlations with individual level income. Um, and to, to use the smallest geographic unit or socioecological level that's possible, which is generally good practice in this sort of research anyway. But additional data, additional evidence that, for example, census tract data does a better job predicting individual level measures, individual level variables than the county did. And, and to keep in mind that the differences in accuracy of the area level vet variables um, across subgroups and across regions can muddle these estimates of the relationship between SES and health in, in ways that aren't fully understood um, and, and probably introduce some bias in both directions when we, when we create these estimates. So with that, I'm, I'm going to finish up. I'd like to thank my collaborators um, who are listed here, some of whom are on the line. Um, and, and I've listed the citations for two of these papers up here. Um, and I look forward to hearing your questions during the Q&A session. Thanks a lot.